Because some people are like predators. There are people in your life, in my life, throughout the course of our lives, who, who operate like predators. And here's why I use the word predator. The predator is out to take. 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 Then take again. Then take. And take some more. Because that's the way the predator survives. They take and take, but they never give. And there are predators in our lives. Some of them are like wolves. The wolves are the people who are just downright mean. And there really are some mean people in this world. They don't seem to have a heart. They probably do. But it's so crusted over by concrete and junk that they no longer feel it. If you're in a situation where you're being abused by some predator, you have just got to do whatever's necessary, however drastic, to get out of that cage or else they'll destroy you. Other people are like a hyena. They're not quite as frightening, at least not in our minds. I think of a laughing hyena, but really the hyenas, I'm told, do most of their laughing right before they attack. And there are people in your life who are witty and quick and sharp, and they're funny, and they have a way of saying things that make everybody laugh, but if you're the one it is directed towards you're going you're gonna to be doing a fake laugh because something about it is not going to feel right. And you're not going to know just what it is. You'll probably start seeing it on the way home. You'll start realizing that hyena cut me to pieces, slipped my guts open, and laughed about it before I even realized it. These laughing hyenas who, in the name of fun, tear you down, you got to get out of those cages. You got to build some walls to protect. And there's one other kind of hyena, not a hyena, one other kind of predator, the fox. Once I preached a sermon from Song of Solomon about the little foxes that spoil the vine. No, who's afraid of a fox? Not me. Not you, maybe a little bitty kid. The little foxes, though, though they're not going to attack you in an obvious way, they will slip around when it's dark and nobody's looking, and they will nibble at the roots, and they will dig, and they will destroy you in ways you don't even realize are happening until it's too late. There's a lot of predators, and you've got to protect yourself. Do not allow them to trespass into parts of your life where they got no business being. That word trespass, what do you think of when I say trespass? What's another Bible word that we consider to mean the same thing? Trespass, our blank and our trespasses, our our sins and our trespasses. Those are actually two ways of saying the same thing. To sin is to trespass. To trespass is to sin. Now, each of those words have a specific connotation that helps you understand what it's talking about more fully. But trespass, just give a thought to that. If you're trespassing on somebody's land, you're poaching, you're telephoning, Killing fish in their pond. You don't have permission to be there. You're trespassing. You're in a place you're not supposed to be. Doing things you're not supposed to be doing. And you cannot afford to allow trespassers to have full, complete 
access to you. And they can just treat you how they want. And you haven't learned a very important, very important truth. You know what that is? It's simple but powerful. No is a complete sentence. When you tell somebody no, you have no obligation to follow that up with some explanation so that they will feel better about it. Predators aren't going to feel good about it no matter what unless you let them in and take what they want. No is a complete sentence. No keeps trespassers from coming into precious, valuable parts of your soul and doing damage and leaving poison. Now, i got to say this. I realize that there are times, really are times, when you or I will find ourselves in some situation at least for a season. For a season, we're in a situation where I cannot leave this job and I'm working for a hyena. I'm not... I'm not able to leave right now because I can't afford to. If that's the case then okay, but make sure that this is only for a season, for a reason, and the season is how long is it going to take you to do the work, the research, make the connections to find somewhere else that's healthier for your soul so that you do not lie awake at night replaying sickening conversations you found yourself in. So you don't walk around with this resentment that just colors your view of everything. It may take a season, but don't let it take a lifetime. For what would it profit you to spend 50 years in that workplace and get retirement and bonuses and a little praise mixed in, but lose your own soul because you allowed somebody there to trespass. But what do you do if you're there right now? If you're there right now, you can, you can be physically present to people without being wide open to them. And it probably needs, it probably will take a sermon in itself sometime to really explain fully what I mean by that. But this will have to suffice for now. You can be physically present, close proximity, but you can still protect your soul if you recognize, I cannot afford to engage this person in conversation. Because every time I do, I wish I hadn't. You cannot stop them from making remarks that hurt. You cannot make them leave you alone, but you do not have to engage them. There are times when you can take the words of Jesus. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. In a workplace, a whole lot of nosy questions, manipulative questions can be handled with a yes or a no and a line. And that's the end of the sentence. Not saying it's easy. That's why. After the season, get out. But remember little Red Riding Hood. 
Little Red Riding Hood's mama knew there were woods. I mean, there were wolves in the woods between here and Grandmama's house. Couldn't change the fact that there are wolves out there and that Little Red Riding Hood is likely to meet one. There are wolves out there, there are hyenas, there are foxes, and you will meet them on life's road. But where, what, where did Little Red Riding Hood actually go wrong? It's when she engaged the big bad wolf in conversation. There she goes, frolicking along, happy, swinging her picnic basket, and there's a voice. Good morning, Red Riding Hood. And the moment she turned and saw who it was, it was time to keep going and pick up the pace and don't look back. Oh, but no, she stopped, got into a conversation with a talking wolf. And then she told him too much. She let him in. She did not have to let him in. He found out too much. He found out where she was going. And the wolf ran like the wind ahead of Little Red Riding Hood. And he got to grand Little Red Riding Hood's grandmama's house before she did. And when grandmama saw the wolf, boom, 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 she ran quickly away. And the wolf got in the bed. And he put on grandmama's bonnet. And he pulled it up over his head. Now, if you're a little Red Riding Hood and you walk in that door and see a sight like that, do you engage this creature in conversation? Grandmama, what big ears you have and all that. No. When you recognize the wolf in Grandmama clothing, you slam the door and you get out. Do not get into deep discussions. Do not get into conversations you know are going to be full of conflict and controversy. There are people who just love to argue. Oh, they'll argue about anything. But they'll get most passionate about things like politics and religion. And they love to draw you in. That's the kind of people you simply, you don't have to be rude, you just shut the door and say, we're not going to talk about that today. We've done that before. We know where, you know where I stand. I know where you stand. If I ever change my mind, I'll let you know, and, and you do the same. But if we cannot come to an understanding, I'm going to have to distance myself even further from you. Some people, you can't engage. You can't afford to. One of my favorite sayings, you cannot afford the luxury of a negative thought because it comes in, it grows like a seed. Even more so, you cannot afford the luxury of a close and open, vulnerable relationship with a negative person. Don't do it. Instead, be like the three little pigs, not Red Riding Hood. Three little pigs, one of them at least. He built a strong brick house, walls to protect, and a door to open. He opened the door, not for the wolf, no matter what kind of tricks the wolf tried to play, no matter how the wolf tried to lure him into or out of. No, 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 no. But because he had a door, he was able to set his, to give his brothers a safe place when they were in trouble. If he'd had no doors, if he'd had no understanding of when to open the door and who to open the door for, his brothers would have been eaten alive. Now, I know we're talking about children's stories, but doggone it. Children's stories were put together over time to teach children lessons that they're supposed to remember the rest of their lives, but they don't because they think it's just a cute little story. Have some walls. Have a door. Who, though, do you let in? That's the part. That's the part. 
you've got to know. Well, let me give you a little bit about how I make the decision of who to let in. That is, in other words, I know I, when I say let in, when I say open the door, those are highly symbolic things. I want to make sure that you know how to apply that. To let somebody in means I am trusting enough of this person that I am willing to say what I really think. I'm able to share how I really feel. I'm able to tell them my fears, my anger, because I know that it's safe with them. They come in the door. And thank God they come in the door. I don't know what kind of person I'd become if it hadn't been for the people God has introduced me to at every single phase of life. People I could trust. I could give them a key to my door. And they don't abuse it. They know to come in. And, and, and generally, I'm able to come into their house without even knocking. But that takes a close friend. And it takes a long time to build that. Don't do that with somebody you just met that you don't know. You'll be sorry. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before the swine. The matters of the soul, your fears, your hopes, your frustrations, your true feelings about everything unfiltered. Mm, be careful. Share it, but not with just anybody. Two, two qualifications. Got to be somebody you know is safe. This person, you've never known of this person to gossip. If they gossip to you about somebody else, you don't be a dumb little red riding hood and think they won't do the same with you. Recognize that. They gossip to you about somebody else, then whatever you tell them, they will eventually share it with somebody else. And you've been violated. Make sure they're honest. The other thing is make sure they're helpful. Because there are some people you really can't trust. Um, maybe you have a close relationship with a nephew or a child. And you can trust them. They are maybe a parent who's an elderly parent. You totally trust them. And they've helped you many times down through the years. But on this thing you're, that's causing you trouble right now, this question that you don't have answers to, this problem you don't know how to solve, you could trust Mama with that one. But can Mama actually help you with that one? In some cases, thank God, yes. But if you... Share that with mama, daddy, grandmother. Just because you can trust them and yet they can't help and you know it. Then what you're doing is a disservice to you and them. Because you're telling them about a problem you have that they will now just worry and worry and worry about from now on. And you get no help. Pick people who are growing themselves. They are growing. When you talk to them, they have stuff of substance to say to you. They tell you the truth. And they don't tell you the truth just to hurt you. Uh -uh. They don't have a butcher knife. They've got a scalpel. And there are people like that. If you've got them, let them in. If you don't got them, if you don't have them, Please open up and begin making those kind of friends. Otherwise, you know what you're living like? You're living like 
Jericho. Walled up. Nothing comes in. Nothing goes out. And you know what happens to people like that? They starve. They starve. They starve. Now, recently, I had a situation that I didn't know how to handle. A very troubling situation. I guess it was about a month ago. I discovered one day, must have been a Tuesday morning, I discovered that we had some financial situations I'd not even noticed. And it scared me. Why did it scare me? Because that fear rose up and it was bigger than my faith. And I got scared. And I checked into it further. Finding out the situation, the financial situation from people who knew. And what I heard, what I discovered, was even scarier. And I knew, okay, I've got to, I've got to address this. I've got to address this. I've got to preach on this. And my thought was, if, if I wasn't aware of it, then I bet most of the people aren't either. I've got to make them aware of it. I've got to let them know. Because if they know, they'll rise up. They'll, 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 they'll take care of this. I just need to know. Now, that part was good. That part was necessary. That part you'll hear me do again, I'm sure. Oh, but the other parts. Mm. Thank you you didn't walk out during that. I wouldn't have blamed you looking back if you had. Now, some of you were here, and you heard that sermon like four weeks ago where I talked about the Christians who gave their life for the sake of the gospel. And then how you will not be called upon to do that, but the most you're going to be called upon to do is to give financially. And the implication was, my Lord, if you're not willing to do that, what kind of pathetic excuse for a Christian are you? You know what that's called? It's called manipulation. And it's a sin. It's a commonly occurring sin in churches and among preachers. Preachers who allow fear to slip up and grab them from behind. And rather than calling for help, from the people who have keys to my soul. It didn't even cross my mind. They were there. The people were there. That could have talked with me about that. They'd have been like the people in some of these scriptures I wrote down. But I don't have time to go into. But like Galatians 6 two, Share each other's burdens. James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so you may be healed. And let's consider, Hebrews 10, let's consider how we can spur one another on to good deeds. Thank God, I have some people like that. I didn't use them. And so, while in a state of fear, I unconsciously dropped back into a way of operating and a way of preaching that I outgrew a long time ago because I realized it was no good. It's, it's wrong. Anything, you've heard me preach this, anything that is designed to make people afraid and guilty in order to motivate them is not of God. In this case, it was mainly the fear in me and so I did this sermon, and if you're really sensitive soul to things like that, you probably picked up on it. 
Others may not have picked up on it. You don't even know what I'm talking about. There are a few, there, I'm sure there are some. Some people have told me they love that sermon. We needed that. But I knew, I knew, it wasn't right. And uh, here's what happened. As I finished up the service that day, having spoken out of fear, one of those people I talked about who's got a key to my soul, walked into it right here. And there was no judgment in that person's eyes. There was some sadness, almost a tear. And that person hugged me. Said, that was hard for you, wasn't it? That didn't feel natural, did it? And I felt my heart strangely warm. And I felt two things at once. A friend has come to me immediately and they've let me know in the most gentle, loving way, time that you go really think about this. That afternoon I got a text from another close friend with a key to my soul and it simply said, are you okay? Let me know if you want to talk. I did. And it's like scales fell from my eyes and I saw things that I'd not seen because, and here's a lesson for everybody, when you are in a state of fear, you're in a state of anger, you are not yourself. You are not seeing things clearly. The fear, the anger, it is distorting your view of everything. You got blinded. You are temporarily blinded. And that's when you got to call upon those people who have a key to your soul. I thank God I had those people. I wish to God I'd called them before the sermon rather than after. But you know what I realized? I realized an application of a verse I've been preaching hard for three months in one way or another. Actually, two verses that go together, both from 1 John. God is love, and there's no fear in love. God is love, there's no fear in love. Now put that together. No fear in love, there's no fear in God. We can all agree on that, I think. And what does that mean? That means that anything I wrote down that week and anything and everything which came out of my mouth that Sunday was coming from fear and it was not of God. Oh, what a lesson. It just makes me mighty thankful I've got a merciful God and Merciful people. But I want to tell you, whether that bothered you or not, that was wrong. And I share that example because I've been wanting to address it, but also because it's just a powerful example showing what happens when you are operating all by yourself. And there are no wise people helping you formulate your decision. Take the key to your soul today. Make some copies.